Good afternoon and welcome to American History uh, 1301. This is a lecture on the Jackson administration, the age of Jackson, and uh, the presidency of James K. Polk. Uh, in 1828, uh, Andrew Jackson assumed the presidency of the United States, or won the presidency of the United States, uh, won it quite handily over one of, uh, a couple of his arch villains or arch enemies, uh, John Quincy Adams and Henry Clay. And in 1828, Jackson was feeling like he was on top of the world. And Jackson felt like this was a uh, vindication of all that he had uh, promoted and all that he supported. And Jackson in 1828 uh, felt like this was, uh, in a sense, his uh, opportunity to shine. And in 1828, uh, the, the world of Andrew Jackson is going to not come crashing down, but it's certainly going to be uh, irrevocably altered. Oftentimes the phrase is you're never the same again or this changes everything or uh, we'll, we'll never be uh, quite what we once were or whatever. Uh, those phrases are oftentimes overworked and overused and uh, worn out and killed because of that overuse. But really in truth, uh, for all the cliché of it, there is true uh, at times in the life of a man or in a nation you're never the same again. Uh, and in many respects with Andrew Jackson it's both, uh, for the nation and for the man. In 1828, as you already know, Andrew Jackson is going to see his wife die. Uh, she's going to have a heart attack. Uh, she had had a bad, uh, bad heart for some time, uh, congestive heart failure for all intents and purposes. Uh, and Andrew Jackson's beloved Rachel will have a heart attack, and she essentially mourns herself to death over what was said uh, about her uh, and Andrew's relationship during the campaign of 1828. And then right around Christmas time, 1828, Andrew Jackson uh, buries his wife. Uh, in fact, actually, the story goes like this. Uh, Jackson himself did not go to the funeral. Uh, he was there, uh, in a sense. Uh, he was there, but he could not uh, bring himself to see his beloved Rachel interred in her uh, famous rose garden uh, and there at the hermitage outside of Nashville. Uh, worth noting, the man who is going to lead the procession out of, for the funeral out of Jackson's uh, house, or actually I think it was the, uh, the Presbyt uh, little chapel that they built uh, there on the grounds, uh, leading the casket to the interment site is going to be governor of Tennessee and friend of the Jacksons, especially General Jackson, uh, Sam Houston. Uh, governor Houston was very close to them. He was like a surrogate son uh, to the Jackson family. Anyways, uh, but Andrew did not go to the, at least to the interment, uh, and the thing is, the very next day, essentially, I believe it was about uh, December 26th, may have been January 2nd, for whatever reason, last week of the very first days of 1829, last week of 28, of course, uh, Jackson is going to load up with his entourage and his caravan, and they're going to take off and leave for the long trip from Nashville, Tennessee, to Washington, D.C., uh, in that time period is not a short trip, It's a, especially because the president-elect is traveling and lots of towns are going to want to see uh, uh, the hero, uh, as he's called, the hero of New Orleans, the hero of the common man. Lots of towns are going to want to feed him and to uh, give him a banquet uh, in his honor. Uh, Jackson uh, has to oblige. It's good politics, uh, even though at times uh, eating the rich food of a banquet uh, could be bad for one's health. And Jackson, as I've already said, has had bad health. Uh, he's got horrible health, one of which is the, uh, his digestive tract is all in a, in a mess, uh, partially just simply because of the amount of lead and mercury that he was ingesting. It was really hard on his system, along from the poisonous aspect as well. But Jackson is dressed in mourning black. Uh, he is going to travel uh, to Washington, D.C., set up shop in a hotel, and there start to assemble his cabinet, put his cabinet together for political reasons. Uh, every president does that to some degree or another. Uh, some presidents feel more constrained by politics. I've got to reward factions within the political party that got him elected. Others less restrained and feel like they need to reward and uh, reward friendships. Others still say, I need the best man available. Occasionally you'll see that. Uh, but there's always uh, some form of calculus and some sort of arithmetic and formula for putting together a cabinet. And so Jackson uh, in, the, uh, in Jan February and now especially Mar late February and early March of 1829, right before the inauguration, remember the inaugurations in that era, they took place in March uh, 6th uh, of 8, no, excuse me, March 3rd of 8, March 6th, 8, no, March 3rd, 1829, or Eight, March 3rd of the year. Either way, you can look it up in the Constitution. Uh, but early March is when the president would be inaugurated. 
And so the president-elect, in this case Jackson, is going to uh, really set up shop in Washington, D.C. He shows up about a week before his inauguration, and it's obvious the transfer of power is getting ready to take place. And so Jackson uh, is, because he's a celebrity, draws many people into the community. He draws many people who wanted to see him take the oath of office. Uh, I've already documented the fact that there was a riot on his election day, or rather his inaugural day. There was a riot at the White House. They tore up the White House and what have you. So for those men and women who had thought that if you elected Andrew Jackson as the President of the United States, you were setting the United States up for dictatorship, certainly mob rule, and uh, the, over, uh, the overrunning of all that is uh, good and decent in society by the uh, hoi polloi, the common man, the bungler, and so forth, the fact is, is that Jackson's uh, pres uh, inaugural uh, festivities were uh, rambunctious in the least. Uh, and frankly, riot is uh, far more likely so. But anyways, Jackson's presidency is quite uh, inconsequential, uh, partially because, one, he's uh, kind of the, the hero, the common man, as he's been called. Uh, he is a symbol of an age. Uh, he is, uh, in a sense, uh, the rise of democratic, small d and large d politics. Uh, it's democratic in the sense that small d is, is that in 1828 you had a lot more people, thousands more, in fact millions more Americans voted in 1828 than they did in previous electoral cycles for the presidency. And it, that will only increase. Now, to be clear, not everybody who elect, uh, voted in 1828 is going to be a man uh, or a woman or of all colors, races, and so forth. Uh, in 1828 and going forward, the, uh, the franchise was largely limited to free male and 21. Free born, meaning that a, he was uh, not a slave or some sort of servant, but especially a slave. Uh, he was male, of course, we all know what that is, and he's of 21 years of age or older. Uh, though there was uh, obviously restrictions and so forth, at least the franchise, the idea of the vote is uh, expanding and getting wider. And so Jackson is a symbol for that era, uh, and the idea of Jacksonian democracy is a term you might put in your notes. Uh, Jacksonian democracy is starting to take hold in the United States. Uh, Jackson himself was not a Democrat in the sense that he, small d again, uh, that he was always in favor of mob rule. He always in favor of the people voting. He is at times. Uh, but if you look at his record in New Orleans during the battles and such, if you look at him as president, uh, he, he, especially for somebody like a Jackson, uh, when he was in power, he did not share power and just say, let's vote for everything. Now, that was not Jackson's idea of uh, sharing a power. However, it is fair to say that Andrew Jackson is a, in favor of democracy, uh, and that's, this is going to be true for a lot of people. They're, they're in favor of democracy, uh, in favor of voting in the general idea, and they don't try to subvert it otherwise. Uh, but they're really in favor of it when the democracy votes for what they want to vote for. And that, that's true for political uh, actors throughout the history of the United States, regardless of party, in my opinion. But the fact was is that Jackson was a Democrat, small d. He was a man of democracy, small d. He was elected by the people, small, uh, no, small, small p. But no, the people voted for him. Not every person, of course, but uh, they did. Uh, and it horrified uh, many Whigs that uh, this uh, mob rule or these uh, individuals backing Jackson would uh, come to the forefront. And one of the other things that's associated with Jackson uh, isn't just the idea of democracy, but it's also in the same vein of the people voting. And the, there's uh, this idea uh, is, is that uh, Jackson is also going to be associated with the filling of, tr of, uh, of federal offices, federal jobs, post office especially. But the filling of federal jobs and uh, positions with friends. Jackson's friends, uh, one of Jackson's uh, supporters uh, in the early, early days of, of his administration in 1829 said, uh, when asked about what do you do with the job seekers, because one of the things Jackson ran on in 1824 and especially in 1828 was is that the uh, presidency was being hindered. The country was being hurt by bureaucrats who were not responsive to the will of the people. That idea of democracy ruling the nation. He represented the people, those sorts of ideas there. And so one of the things Jackson put forward, and his friends will go forward with it, is uh, a form of reform. What I'm about to talk about is called uh, vernacularly and commonly in history is the, is the uh, spoil system. Now, some of you knew it because you've already had it before in 02, and some of you are hearing this now for the first time, the spoil system. 
But the spoil system is the idea of uh, voting, uh, excuse me, replacing your enemies in jobs, in the federal government in this case. You replace your enemies and you put uh, your friends in office. You essentially said more uh, succinctly, uh, you fire your enemies and you hire your friends, the spoil system. But in Jackson's day, especially in the early days of Jackson's administration, uh, they didn't call it the spoil system. Uh, it'll get that nickname quickly, but they called it the rotation system. You rotate out your political enemies. You hire your friends who will do what the president instructs them to do. They will carry out the policies of the president and the cabinet, and, of course, the Congress, too, of course. But the executive will not be hindered by the pure permanent workers in the government, the bureaucrats. You want your friends in, uh, pushing the policy, but it's not just because the president says so, but because the president was elected by the people in a roundabout way. But the president was elected by the people, and the people have a right to see what they want to have done in the government. They have a right to see that uh, put into effect. But the rotation system, as it's initially known, will quickly become called the spoil system because one of Jackson's friends uh, musing and uh, uh, chortling, I guess you could say, over the beauty of the system uh, for uh, political advancement, said, to the victor go the spoils. To the victor go the spoils. So, all right. So there it sticks. The phrase, the victor go the spoils, the spoils system sticks, and it is the dominant way by which you hire and you fire uh, federal employees, at least to some fraction, to some percentage, for the next hundred years. You're going to have, uh, if you take me for O2 or you have an O2 class, you'll hear it mentioned probably. I'll mention it in class certainly. But you're going to have some reforms done on it. But even into the 1960s, uh, the U.S. Post Office, which was at that point the Post Office Department, not the Postal Service, but the Post Office was a uh, department that was famous for having political uh, hacks in some cases, political uh, allies in others being uh, put into office. So if a uh, Democrat was president, you would hang the picture of Lyndon Johnson uh, or uh, Barack Obama or Bill Clinton in the post office, and that postmistress or postmaster probably was a Democrat. If it's Republicans running the show, then that postmaster is probably going to be a Republican postmaster. Does it matter? Do they have to vote? Well, yeah, it's, it's that way. So the spoil system uh, takes uh, many forms. Uh, lots of corruption is there at times, at times less. Sometimes it's overblown, but it, it had its moments. But anyways, when you talk about Andrew Jackson and his uh, marks upon uh, American history, that's a big one, actually. Uh, and it starts with Jackson, and it gets worse after he leaves the office. But as I said, Jackson was a, a Democrat, small d, for democracy, democracy, small d, but he's also a Democrat, large d. And uh, to be clear, the Democratic Party uh, that we know today really takes its direct lineage from Andrew Jackson's time period. Uh, you can make an indirect route. Uh, you can take an indirect uh, make an indirect case historically, and it's not a hard one to make. That the Democratic Party of 2020, at the time of this recording, can take its lineage all the way back to Thomas Jefferson with the old Democratic Republicans. But more directly and more correctly, I would say is, is that it begins with Andrew Jackson. So if you're a Democrat watching this. Uh, you, and, uh, particularly if your family, probably your grandparents, or maybe your parents, are real will horse active Democrats, uh, that they would vote Democrat over for, uh, if they'd vote for a Democratic yellow dog, uh, over top of anything else, uh, they would never vote Republican, never get caught dead voting Republican. The fact of the matter is, is that, uh, uh, that political party that they're voting for, uh, that idea of democracy or the Democrats, it really comes with Jackson's presidency, uh, the idea of people. Anyways, Jackson's uh, dem democracy or his Democratic Party uh, is going to be made up of a kind of an interesting coalition. You will, in the Northeast, especially in Maryland, New Jersey, and at times New York, and sometimes Pennsylvania too, you'll find a heartland of Democrats there in the cities. In addition to that, you will also find Democrats in the South. Not completely like you'll get after the Civil War, but there are lots and lots of Democrats in the Southland. Remember, in the 1830s, the South is what we would call Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Tennessee, and so on. Uh, the Democrats uh, really are made up of kind of two groups, uh, farmers on the one hand. Uh, not all farmers are Democrats, but many were. 
uh, and also those uh, those industrialists, in some cases industrialists, uh, but those certainly some of those workers and uh, some of those uh, those businessmen in those mid-Atlantic states. In fact, actually, when you talk about the democracy, which is also the, called uh, the Democratic Party at times, when you talk about Jackson's Democratic Party, uh, it has some very distinctive ideas. And this is worth remembering going forward. I'll probably put something like this on the exam, uh, is, is that when you talk about uh, the, the Democratic Party, they were believers at this point in time, in the 1830s and the 40s, all the way up through arguably till 1900, 1915, the Democratic Party was a party of small government, extremely small government. If you think of the Republicans as being anti-government, being anti-large government, all those sorts of things there, that's simply, uh, that may be true today in a sense. Uh, that's an arguable position, frankly, uh, considering the, the facts. But anyways, the Demo Republicans over the years have claimed to be the party of small government. Well, anyways, the Democrats of the 19th century, prior to the Civil War, under Andrew Jackson, certainly were the party of small government. Uh, it was Jackson who, in the only time, there's only been one his year in the history of the United States, that the U.S. government actually paid off the debt of the United States, not just ran at a, a surplus or a break-even limit in the budget, but actually did that plus paid off the national debt. Basically, for the entire 243-year history of this country, or let's say it a little differently, for the 200, and I guess, uh, let me think a second here, 232-year, whatever, 1787 from 2020 is, but from the entire history of the U.S. government, at least under this Constitution, with exception of one year, and that was 1835, the U.S. government has run in a debt. Uh, debt is not, in the governmental sense, not a bad thing, but it can be a horrible thing uh, if it's uh, out of control. But it also has some good effect in the sense that it generates bonds, and people want to buy bonds, especially if they know they're going to get back the bonds, or know they're going to get back their principal plus interest. It creates money, and it multiplies money in a sense. So, uh, But Jackson was gung-ho, and so were many of his Democrats, that the government had to be small, to have a small footprint, and have at little or no debt. Jackson himself, to be honest with you, is... Uh, going to have some issues with money. He has some profound issues with regard to the, uh, with the, with banks. Some of that has to do with, uh, some of the, his life experiences, as many of us would have. Uh, probably, uh, as, as I'm recording this, I'm recording it during the pandemic of 2020, uh, the coronavirus pandemic, so who knows how long I'll use this video. I'm, by the time I may quit using it, I may have, uh, all white instead of some white in my hair. Well, anyways, uh, all that to say, though, is, is that when we talk about this, uh, this event, this coronavirus in 2020, uh, for some of you watching this, maybe many of you watching this, this will be a definitive moment in your life. Uh, perhaps tragically, perhaps uh, in, uh, in emancipatory in the sense that you were, uh, you were freed of doubt or you, were, you moved out of your house and you never went back. I don't know. But it, it just may be a moment in your life you'll say, I'll never forget the months that I was in lockdown and school closed for a year. So, or rather closed for months at the time of this recording. Anyways, life has, uh, happens to do that and will uh, make an impact upon Jackson. So, uh, and this is true not just for Jackson, but for many like him, uh, especially the Panic of 1819, which I'll refer to more in a bit. The Panic of 1819 will have an impact upon Jackson and his followers that they never got over. And so Jackson's dealings with money at times can be very primitive uh, and be very uh, very different from by our modern thinking. He, he had a profound distrust of money and money need interest, for good and for bad. Uh, so uh, the Democratic Party wasn't just uh, against banks at times, it was against uh, widespread money at times, at those times they, that policies do the exact opposite of what they profess. Uh, it's fair to say about the Democrats in the uh, 1830s under Jackson is, is that they're also opposed, uh, generally speaking, uh, to uh, national improvements uh, funded by the federal government. Today, we would never think twice about the federal government showering money or shoveling boatloads of money or wagonfuls of money onto highway projects or airport projects or road projects or some sort of infrastructure projects, let alone education or this or that or the other. But in the 1830s, 
One of the profound differences between the political parties, and this now is the case, between the Whig Party on the one hand and the Demo Whig Party, which is led by Henry Clay particularly and others like him, Daniel Webster, uh, and on the other hand, say, a, a Andrew Jackson or Martin Van Buren, one of the profound differences between the political parties is the issue of internal improvements. I mentioned the fact that John Quincy Adams was a fan of what was, has been known historically as Henry Clay's American system. The thing is, is that Jackson was opposed to turnpikes. Uh, if, if a state of Kentucky wants a turnpike, which is a form of a road, then they can build it themselves. The federal government should not build roads that are only within states, for an example. Now, that thinking changes, and the, the Democrats have moved beyond it to some degree, especially when it affects their own constituents later on. Uh, but in Jackson's time period, in the years after Jackson's time period, uh, there will be a profound distrust of a growing active federal government. When we talk about Abraham Lincoln in the, at the end of this course uh, in 1301, we talk about Abraham Lincoln in several ways, one of which is the Whig Jupiter. So many of the old policies of the American system that uh, Henry Clay is going to promote Internal improvements, regulated money supply, giving away of land, and so forth, uh, high protective tariffs, and, and on and on we can go. The fact that, they, and uh, oh yeah, I almost forgot about this, uh, a university system, uh, on we can go. That American system that, uh, that uh, Jackson and the Democrats opposed uh, and uh, at times virulently or violently opposed uh, will get it put into place because many of the Democrats leave the United States, or at least try to leave the United States in the 1860s during the Civil War. So the old Whigs who become Republicans, they can push their policies. But Jackson and the Democrats are fundamentally very conservative, very conservative, especially viewed through the lens of 2020 at the time of this recording. So Jackson's policies are going to be conservative in nature, uh, restrictive in nature, and so on. So his uh, democracy, his Democratic Party, uh, is also going to be, in this case here, the first of the two. Of the, we've had several major parties in our history, but this is a modern political party. And so that brings us to another point of Jackson's importance and his administration's importance. At times, it's uh, Jackson who makes the waves and uh, makes his uh, name. At other times, it's just the things that are going on around him. So, for example, when we talk about the modern Democratic Party, you need to put in your notes another name. This man's name is Martin Van Buren. Martin Van Buren is a dapper uh, son of a barkeep in Poughkeepsie, New York. And uh, they call him, the, no, excuse me, Kinderhook, New York, not Poughkeepsie. Uh, Kinderhook. His nickname is the Little Red Fox of Kinderhook. In addition to that, uh, Van Buren is going to come from humble backgrounds, uh, not quite as humble as Jackson, as uh, you've seen, or say Abraham Lincoln later. The thing is, is that uh, when you talk about old Martin Van Buren, another president of the United States in the future, Van Buren's greatest contribution as the little red fox of Kinderhook, the little magician, sometimes they call him. Uh, by the way, if you saw him, uh, he was always whiskered, well manicured, uh, slept in the midday uh, sort of thing, loved silk underwear. He was kind of a, he, he loved the high life. Uh, for all of Jackson's talk, he too loved the high life, though you'd never catch Jackson in silk underwear, but Jackson was always immaculately dressed. Uh, that was the way he was. But at the same time, Van Buren's greatest contribution to American history is not his presidency. Van Buren's presidency is really a ruined presidency, and it's not a good one. Uh, it's not as bad as, say, uh, James Buchanan or Andrew Johnson, but it's going to be down in the lower third or the lower quarter of American presidencies. But Van Buren's greatest contribution happens to be, and it's an important concept for you to write down, it happens to be the creation of the modern Democratic Party. It's mo uh, or the modern party system in an American sense, but especially the Democratic Party. What Van Buren does, and his acolytes uh, follow up with and develop, is essentially, amongst other things, the, uh, the uh, convention system. The idea that the party meets in convention in a city. Chicago, if it's Republicans over many, many years, uh, the Democrats have moved it around over the years. But the convention is held, the party comes together, and you have a unification of the party around a set of ideas, a platform, a, a, a particular candidate, in, in the early days, Jackson, of course, and later Van Buren and later others. 
Uh, but the fact is, is that you find out across the country by the party coming together in convention, these representatives of the Democratic Party of Mississippi, or and say I say representatives in the plural, or the Democratic Party of Ohio, the Democratic Party of New York, the De De Democratic Party of uh, uh, Maine, or something like that. The fact of the matter is, is that Jackson's uh, Democratic Party coming together in this great uh, convention or, or conventions over the years. All those different segments across the country will come, and they will have uh, have and know what's going on. Remember, in the 1830s, where we are, there is no mass communication. That's still into the future. The the Morse code, the very famous Morse code, is still a few years to the future. Railroads are just getting off the ground, so we still have a, uh, that's to go. To be fair, and be uh, as maybe one of those factoids that I sometimes use in a test, or I don't. Uh, is is that the the first president uh, to ride a railroad uh, is Jackson? In fact, he comes to Washington D.C. in a horse and buggy or a carriage. He leaves Washington D.C. in 1837 after he is done with his two terms as president. He rides out in a train. So uh, there are changes afoot. But when the convention comes together, it's like a big uh, it's like a big conference call in a modern sense. The, and you could say to a guy from Mississippi, for example, what's the voters of Mississippi, what are they excited about? What's their issue? Which may be very different from New York, probably is going to be different from New York or New Hampshire or Ohio or Indiana. And so you write a platform that is uh, designed to appeal to the widest base that could get you the most votes, of course, win the election, win the electoral college. And so you'll see this convention system uh, uh, developed and refined by Van Buren and his, and his descendants. This is an example of that modern political system. I've already mentioned the spoil system. That, too, is a form of a modern political party. You help your friends and you hurt your enemies. Uh, you don't go into throwing them in jail. That's that's dramatic. That's Russian. But the fact of the matter is, is that uh, when you talk about these... Uh, these, this political party, the aspects of a platform, the aspects of a convention, the aspects of having friends, making promises and doing deals and all that sort of stuff that really becomes a factor in American politics in this time period. So good, good things uh, there. So Martin Van Buren is a master politician. If you wanted to boil him down and down, he was a political animal at his core. For everything you could say about Van Buren, that's his greatest contribution to American history. It's not his presidency. It's forgettable. And when I get to it, I'll pass right by it. Uh, but his president, his uh, political acumen, with one notable exception, is going to be spot on. He's one of the greatest politicians in the history of the United States, meaning one of those natural-born politicians. Think of it for those of you who's played sports. He's like a natural-born athlete. That man or that woman who you saw run and said, that is the most graceful, fast, athletic person you've ever seen, and they really were good. And that maybe they, you know, they just, you saw them hit the ball, you saw them uh, play football or whatever the sport was, you just looked at them, it's like, man, I wish I could run like that. Or you wish somebody could play, you could play the piano or do something else like the, the great maestros. In this case, that's Van Buren. But he was human. So Jackson is going to bring Van Buren into the fold, and Van Buren, who is as cunning as they come, he knows how to talk to Jackson. Jackson, I won't say can be manipulated, though at times it's probably true, but Jackson certainly is influenceable. And so the first major, uh, the first major event that blows up in Jackson's presidency is something to us that would be a, it probably to you listening to me tell the story, is probably going to say this is a ridiculous event. Why on earth would anybody get upset over who's marrying who? Different times and different allowances. In, 13, in the 1700s, and we started this course out now seemingly months and months ago, and it seems like an eternity ago at, at times, I talked about a group of people called the Borderlanders. Jackson, remember, is a type of a Borderlander. He's a Scotch-Irish uh, second-generation kid. Anyways, when they came here in the 1700s, they were rough and rowdy and oftentimes very risque in their dress. But because of uh, changes in the social moral code, changes in the thinking of the United States, the Second Great Awakening will come into play here too, more, a revolution in manners and morals, uh, especially for women. Uh, and the term is going to be at least a famous historical essay is called uh, The Cult of True Womanhood.
you're going to see women and men, but women especially change the way they dress. And they're going to dress in a very, very different manner. And I don't remember if I said this in another video that I sometimes give the students, but I'll take uh, be a very brief about this uh, version of it anyways. Is an Anglo woman in the seven, excuse me, I say Scotch Irish to be more precise. A Scotch Irish woman, a borderlander of the 1780s or 1760s who just splashed ashore is going to be risque and kind of revealing in her clothing. Her husband might walk around with a shirt off, kids running around frantically in the yard half naked. By the time you get to the 1820s, now especially the 1830s in Jackson's presidency, that had changed and changed miserably. That's part of the reason why uh, Rachel got into, uh, had such a hard time is because what was permissible in the 1780s when she marries Andrew, by the time you get to the 17, late, excuse me, the 1820s, late 1820s, is not permissible. You can have changes, sometimes seismic changes in the morals and manners of a society. It's happened throughout our history. It'll happen again in all likelihood. But in the Second Great Awakening, which I would lay some of this at the, uh, at the base of, but you have this idea that a woman that, amongst other things, she must uh, have is a, a value of modesty. She would wear uh, uh, the real modest ones, the real, the real firm believers in this cult of true womanhood would wear co uh, collars up to the neck. They would wear a bonnet. They would wear sleeves that wouldn't just break at the wrist but break down on the hand. They would wear a dress that goes down to the length of the floor. And in that dress at times, especially amongst those who were extra modest, would be uh, sewed rocks or lead weights or something like that to make sure that dress stayed on the ground. In addition to that, uh, she would also uh, sometimes wear gloves if she was wealthy. Uh, in addition to that, even if her, uh, her skirt got blown up by a hurricane gust of wind, you would see not her legs, but you would see bloomers on and under, uh, basically leggings on underneath that. So, uh, it, it was quite restrictive, quite covered up. Uh, and there was, uh, and beyond the physical dress, a, a woman of that era was supposed to be not just modest, but also being very motherly, maternal, very pious, meaning a, a very uh, devout woman, uh, and so forth. Well, that sets us up for what is known as the Eaton Affair, the, or the Petticoat Affair. Well, Peggy Eaton, Peggy Eaton is a uh, young, vivacious woman. And everyone who saw Peggy Eaton when she was a teenager, she was the daughter of a barkeep, uh, an inn owner, a tavern owner there in Washington, D.C. Everyone who saw Peggy as a teenager or as a 20-something-year-old woman said, that, oh my gosh, Peggy was beautiful. And on top of that, she was flirtatious, and those who were less uh, uh, nice, those who were more uh, waggish and waspish, said that she was more than just flirtatious. But all that to say is, is that when she was a young woman, or a uh, youngish woman, she married... She married a Navy uh, officer who would go out to sea a, a, a part of his uh, job there uh, in the United States Navy. And the, the gossips in Washington, and remember this about Washington, D.C. during the time of Jackson, Washington, D.C. is a city of no more than 20,000 people. And if I had to check my numbers, I feel like it might actually be closer to 15,000. Most of you watching this don't come from any, uh, have never been uh, or never lived in a city of 15,000 people. Most of you come from a city of, of half a million or more. All that to say is, is that everybody knew everybody. They knew the bar owner in that town, and Peggy had a reputation, especially when her husband was out of town. Which, by the way, he, uh, and, and this bar, by the way, was frequented not by the riffraff of society, but by senators and congressmen and secretaries of state and important individuals in the nation's capital. Well, one of the individuals that went there quite a bit was a friend of Andrew Jackson's. The guy's name is John Eaton. And John Eaton uh, is going to eventually what, be Secretary of the Navy, as I recall. But anyways, John Eaton uh, was there. And that shortly after Peggy's uh, husband had an unfortunate accident, and I don't mean this like in some conspiracy, but he just died at sea. Shortly after that occurred... Well, Peggy Eaton and John Eaton got married. And, well, now Peggy is in the cabinet. In the cabinet of President Andrew Jackson, along with a whole bunch of other ladies and husbands and so forth. Andrew Jackson's uh, vice president at this time, his first vice president, is a fellow named John C. Calhoun. Calhoun of South Carolina. And Calhoun's going to be a major, major contender and a major player in American politics 
in the uh, in this time period. He's one of the great bulls of the Senate, as they used to call it, meaning one of the great forces of nature, one of the great talkers and, and lecturers and speakers during this time period. He, early in his career, John C. Calhoun was a nationalist, expand the nation. But as we go through the 1830s and now to the 1840s and the 1850s, and we start to bring in the issue of the American Civil War, one of the things you see with Calhoun is, is that he becomes more and more of what you can call in your notes a sectionalist. But back to the story of Peggy Eaton, it has the effect of dri drive, this. what the story is going to do is it ends up uh, driving a wedge between Jackson and his vice president, uh, Calhoun. So anyways, Calhoun's uh, wife's name is Flora. No, excuse me, Fluoride, Fluoride Calhoun. Anyways, whatever the case may be, I would not name my daughter that, but at the same time, different era, different naming habits. All that to say is uh, Fluoride Calhoun would not uh, have anything to do with Peggy Eaton. Basically, Fluoride considered Peggy Eaton a glorified strumpet, which is, uh, we were talking, my wife and I were talking at the time of this recording recently about the word strumpet. And uh, she said she reminded me that it's not just a prostitute, but it's a woman who is very forward about what she is and so forth. And so uh, there was a whole lot of uh, ruffles the feathers in the female, uh, in, the, in the ladies' quarters, so to speak, of American uh, political society, high American society. Remember, Andrew Jackson has no wife. She's dead. She's recently dead. On top of that, Jackson, who, was, who had been stung by the criticism of Rachel, and basically they called Rachel, uh, and, and this is a term I, I don't really like to use, but I will just so you get understanding of what was said about Rachel, was that basically she was a slut. Uh, that's what they said about Rachel in so many words, and here Jackson is watching Peggy being slandered, and he, he liked Peggy. Jackson liked her, not in some sort of romantic way, but he thought that she was being unfairly maligned and thought that she was a good and misunderstood woman. And Jackson involves himself in the dispute between Peggy Eaton, Fluoride Calhoun, other cabinet members' wives, and so on. You know, one of the persons who's going to uh, slide in there as a, a sly as a fox is uh, the, uh, oh, what was he at that point in time? Let me think a second here. He was Secretary, it was, does, no, it was not Secretary of State yet. Oh, gosh, I'm drawing a blank on what his designation was at that point in time. But Martin Van Buren was going to be a major player in Jackson's uh, uh, presidential administration, maybe in Secretary of State even. But anyways, all that to say is Van Buren is a widower at that point in his life. Uh, and ja Van Buren slides in and basically comforts the president and gives him counsel uh, and in the process helps drive that wedge between the president and the vice president. Because remember... Everybody in the cabinet in 1829 uh, is thinking, who will be Jackson's successor? Because everybody thought in 1829 that Andrew Jackson would only serve one term because he was an old and or aging and decrepit man. You know, all those health issues we've already discussed. And so Van Buren thought, well, this is my opportunity to sideline the vice president and become the heir apparent. Because by this point in time, basically, Sam Houston had crawled into the bottom of a bottle and he was out of, getting ready to be out of the picture. Anyways, all this is to say is, is that uh, there's a whole lot of politics. It's all rather shabby and it, just, uh, it, it was kind of, uh, you know, just silly in a sense. But anyways, it, uh, it caused a lot of consternation in Jackson's cabinet. It's the first great issue. I say first issue, really, not great issue. So we had the rotation system, uh, which I've already mentioned, so this that would be number one, actually. Uh, Jackson's political uh, effect. Also, you talk about the uh, Peggy Eaton and the Petticoat Affair, which has effect of not only just, uh, but really has the effect of splitting Jackson from Calhoun. And then there are several other major issues. And, and the, two, the three big ones, the, let me give you this next one, and I'm just going to go through it quickly, is the issue of Indian removal. One of the things to keep in mind about Andrew Jackson was is that he was no misty-eyed individual uh, regarding the Indians. Uh, he never thought the, the Native Americans as these great tribes or these great nations. He thought that was uh, mostly just uh, optimistic, pious, uh, unreasonable balderdash uh, by the founders. Jackson was a second-generation leader, that, so we're clear about that. Jackson's a second-generation leader in America. He's not of the founding generation. But he knew of Jefferson and he knew of Washington because he'd served in the Congress early in his, his life. Jackson never had that uh, 
nostalgic, maudlin thinking about the Indian nations. He thought they were disjointed tribes, uh, basically, that were uh, at times violent, at times, uh, well, frankly, just uh, unworthy of the land that they claimed. To be blunt about it, he did not think they were nations. He just simply, uh, he looked upon them as tribes and not as nations, and you deal with them as such. And Jackson, by the way, had fought them, and he did not have this uh, notion about the noble savage. He didn't believe that. Uh, and it's it's interesting, too, when you talk about Jackson. On the one hand, you could say that, but at the same time, if I hadn't said it before to you, Jackson also had an adopted son named Lynn Coya, who he took into his house and gave an education, gave a, a vocational. The kid dies of tuberculosis at age 18. So Jackson's uh, Indian policy is going to be kind of complicated. But he was not a he was not sentimental. He did not have uh, any Quaker tendencies there, as we well know. So the Indian removal issue is this, is basically what do you do with the tribes of the Old Southwest? What do you do with the tribes of the western United States at that point in time, which is basically butting up against or slightly beyond the Mississippi River? And Jackson basically settles on this, and by our lights and standards at this time period is going to be a very harsh thing. But Jackson's time period, it was considered reasonable considering the fact that there were very few people willing to send the U.S. Army out to protect the Native Americans, and it's arguable, would, any, would the Army even go if you'd sent to protect the uh, Native Americans? But Jackson said this. He basically said to the uh, Cherokee and the Creek and the Choctaw and the other tribes in this Indian removal business, he's going to say to them uh, in, in this basic policy outline, of, you have three choices. Number one, you are uh, going to have to uh, assimilate into white society or Anglo society and adopt Anglo practices, which includes sedentary farming, uh, a, a dress, in addition to that, religion, and some other ideas. If you do that, you can stay uh, east of the Mississippi River, which was somewhat true at times, and other times simply not true. Uh, then on top of that, uh, if you won't, if you, this is Jackson speaking to the Indian tribes in a sense. He, Jackson said basically is if you won't do that, then uh, you need to move west of the Mississippi and you need to move to what we'll call the Indian Territory. Later, that is called Oklahoma. You need to move there, and you will be moved westward onto the plains, which at that point in time, remember, is thought of as the Great Desert. There's not going to be any settlement out there for a long time, which was at least a 50-year window. And so you need to move westward. So when you talk about the Trail of Tears and the Cherokee particularly, you're going to Oklahoma or light, westward, that's that idea there. So you go westward, you're given land or given a tribe, given so forth, uh, that's where you go. So, okay, you have that. Then uh, if you refuse to go westward and to, to, so you maintain your identity or you refuse to assimilate completely, then your only choice then basically is to uh, suffer annihilation. Uh, and it won't be so much the U.S. Army, at least initially, won't be doing this. Uh, event, obviously, that changes. Uh, it will be those settlers going westward into Georgia, Mississippi, and so on, other states going westward. Uh, they're going to take your land, and they're going to drive you out. That's just what's going to happen, and I won't stop them, and I can't stop them. But mostly, yeah, certainly won't. But anyways, all that to say is Jackson's Indian policy is a very controversial and uh, at times a very shabby uh, policy in the history of the United States. If you talk about Jackson's, uh, if there were tin cans tied around his leg, uh, his historical leg, this is the one. This is the big one. Uh, so, and, and really and truthfully, if you ever wondered why, if you ever come across a $20 bill, and that's got Andrew Jackson's face on it, and you see it blacked out, you see it X'd out, and you ever wondered why? Why on earth is that blacked out next out? And the answer is simply Andrew Jackson is hated with justification, I would say, by the Cherokee and other tribes that are found in the state of Oklahoma. The Indians never called him, to my knowledge, uh, the tribes that dealt with Jackson and lost to Jackson never called him Old Hickory, to my knowledge. They always called him that Indian killer, that mad dog Jackson or my preferred one that I always use is called sharp knife. So all that to say, that's another major issue in the Jackson presidency. But as Jackson's presidency unwinds and unfolds, the next uh, thing that's going to come up is one of the precursors to the American Civil War. Uh, in a sense, what I'm about to get into, you might call, is the uh, dry run, the dress rehearsal of the reasons for the Civil War and why we can uh, basically separate and break apart. So when we talk about Jackson in the Civil War, 
uh, or rather Jackson in what's known as the nullification crisis, Jackson is going to have one of the great crises in the history of the United States on his hands, and it threatens to split the nation up completely. So one of the things uh, that I need to bring to your attention and has to do with this issue of the coming of the Civil War. The issue of slavery and the controversy about the issue of slavery had been in the, in the nation since essentially the Constitutional Convention. It got worse as slavery was becoming more and more obvious that slavery was not going to die of its own volition. It was not going to fade out like it does in Mexico. It's not going to fade out like it does in Britain, and you're not going to be able to win a peaceful emancipation like you do in Britain as well. And that, of course, is something we've already discussed. That is the invention of the cotton gin and the wild profitability of cotton especially. There are other, other uh, products and other crops that, are, uh, you, that utilize the slave labor, but nothing comes close to the importance of cotton in that sense. And so when we talk about uh, the spreading of slavery, and as the, the voracious desire and the voracious consumption of land going westward, because remember this, if you try to grow cotton in one area for too long, it wears the land out. It's, here's a term for your notes. It's called cottoned out. And so you move westward, westward, westward. And it has led some historians to say even the Texas Revolution was nothing less and nothing more than just a slaveholder's uprising. I reject that as a historian. I think it's far more complicated than that, but there is some element of truth that some of the, indi some of the individuals in the Texas Revolution were committed slave owners and would fight to keep their slaves because it meant livelihood, it meant money, it meant position, and so on. But as people, especially slave-owning uh, Southerners, go westward, they go westward from Tennessee to Missouri, and as you should read, and I'll just leave it here, the Missouri Crisis of 1820 uh, it takes place, was, and the question is, what will Missouri be? Will it be a slave state because it was part of the, uh, uh, because it was part of Louisiana, or will it be a free state? What will happen? And the question becomes, what happens in the Congress? This, the northern states grow much faster in population, so the House of Representatives was always pro-northern in a slave versus free mentality. But in the U.S. Senate, because you know the Senate is a two-state, or rather two senators per state setup, the southern states, or the slave states, could hold their own and always keep that precarious balance and keep power in the Senate and therefore have an effective block on either slavery legislation or other things that would affect slavery, cotton, and southern industry and southern agriculture. And so the uh, Missouri crisis, or the Missouri eventually comes the Missouri Compromise of 1820, is known as the fire bell in the night. That's Jefferson's very famous and evocative phrase. The fire bell in the nighttime. So anyways, when we talk about Jackson, excuse me, talk about the Missouri Compromise, there's a lot of issues there. But going westward, you thought the issue of where did, Pete, where did slavery go? That's been settled. In the slavery, or excuse me, in the Missouri Compromise of 1820, uh, all, all the, uh, all the territory north of the 3630 parallel on the map was going to be uh, free. And all everything south of there, which would include Texas or Oklahoma going westward, would be slave. It's not going to stay that way, but there you go. But one of the things that bothered slaveholders and the plantation elite, and certainly Southerners in a large degree, but especially the political class and the economic heavyweights of Southern society, to no degree is the issue of tariffs. Please put that in your notes. Slavery is a moral issue to be sure, but it's also an economic issue. It's a labor system and so on. And if you think back to a previous lecture, when I talked about uh, slavery and I talked about why was slavery profitable is because you could grow so much cotton and send it north to a lesser degree, or you send it mostly to England. England is going to have textile factory and loom after loom after loom, and you send all that raw cotton or slightly processed, lightly processed cotton, and you send that yarn or that, the, that material, and you send it to England, there is great money to be made. Of course, there's that, the trade of uh, loans and such, and plantation owners building the great houses and all that sort of thing. However, remember this. This goes back to Alexander Hamilton in the early days of the Republic. Alexander Hamilton and northern industry took as gospel truth, and there was a lot of truth in it, that you, or rather the nation, needed to have high protective tariffs. 
A protective tariff, or a tariff, is a tax on, in this case, imported goods. A protective tariff is a tariff that is trying to keep out certain products, or maybe many products, so that it raises the cost of an English dress over top, of, or English shirt, English cheaply made shirt over top, and the tariff raises the price over an American shirt, using the textiles as an example. You're trying to foster American textiles. You're trying to foster American industrialization by a protective tariff. That sounds good. And it's certainly good for the northerner. The northern industrialist likes this. The northern friend of capital likes this. This is the growing of Massachusetts. This is the favor of the middle Atlantic. But to the southerner who grew cotton, this is a disaster. Because Great Britain is not going to sit idly by and say, you know, that's, that's fine, you Americans do what you want to. The British are going to retaliate in kind, and they're going to slap a tariff of their own on what, to, on what they consume to get back at the Americans. It's tit for tat. Remember, the English at times, and I guess I might have said this directly, I might not have, but uh, maybe you intuited it. The English at times are going to realize by the 1840s and 50s that Amer being beholden only to American cotton could be a problem. Uh, politically, it could be a problem economically. It's uh, the idea of maybe we need to keep our eggs in multiple baskets. Uh, and so there's always this looking back toward India, looking back toward other places where you can buy cotton. And so uh, every time that the American government, the U.S. government in Washington, D.C., would raise the level of uh, tariffs, especially if they're trying to be protective. By the way, a tariff can also be used for raising revenue. The U.S. government actually functioned for most of its 19th century existence off of raising revenue through its tariff system. But if you're trying to raise a, a protective tariff to protect an, uh, an industry, the British are going to slap at a tariff on American cotton that hurts the southerner. And so the southern plantation owner and the southern man is upset and outraged. So, in 1828, Jackson and especially Van Buren, the Democratic Party is going to uh, promote through its members of Congress what is known by, in southern circles as the Tariff of Abominations. This tariff is a high protective tariff on uh, goods coming out of England. It was designed as a sop to protect Middle Atlantic um, merchants and uh, manufacturers. Middle Atlantic defined as Maryland and Pennsylvania. Swing states. Swing states in an electoral ca uh, caucus and calculation. Southerners groaned about it. Uh, they were upset about it. And, of course, they called it tariff abominations. They figured it would come down over time. But it didn't. But it helps Jackson win the presidency, at least notionally. Probably did. Probably helped him. But by the time you get to the 1830s, this tariff is high. Uh, there's been some discussion about raising it, certainly very little about lowering it. And the Southerners are beside themselves, uh, especially South Carolina. Write that state down. South Carolina was, by the early 1830s, a, becoming a secondary state. In the early days of the Republic, in the 1700, late 1700s, South Carolina was a frontline, seaboard, southern agricultural state. But by the time you get to the 1830s, 50 years down the road basically, you're looking at South Carolina being a state that sees its best and brightest, especially its most industrious kids. They move away and they leave. Some go to New England, some go to up north, most don't. Most of those third-born sons, second-born sons, the best and the brightest, as it were, of South Carolina, they move westward. They're going to Georgia, to Mississippi, to Texas, to Arkansas, to Missouri. They're going west, seeking uh, their future. Uh, memory serves is, is that uh, James Fannin of Texas Revolutionary fame, and I believe uh, James Bonham of the same revolution, same fame, in a sense, both are Georgians by birth. All this, excuse me, George, and South Carolinians by birth. All this is to say, though, is, is that uh, when we, you see these, them going westward, the port of, South, of Charleston, South Carolina, is being bypassed by New Orleans after it came into the Union, by Mobile, Alabama, which was uh, moving lots and lots of product out of the heartland of the Alabama, uh, the Alabama Cotton Belt or the Black Belt of Alabama, and, and so forth. So you have two major ports uh, siphoning off uh, uh, product and siphoning off a tonnage. South Carolina is desperate in a sense. 
And so this tariff is a pretext for trotting out what's called the nullification doctrine. You'll see this uh, uh, discussed from time to time, even to this day. But what is a nullification doctrine? It is an essentially a doctrine that says is that if a state dislikes a rule or law of the United States government, the state has a right to nullify and refuse to allow that rule or law to be enforced in the state. Because what they're saying is, is that the state is uh, sovereign as well, and it has an immunity to unconstitutional, unright, uh, unjust rules. And if you think about it, that is a major, major uh, issue uh, with regard to the Civil War. Obviously, slavery is the main thing there, but the idea of can the states do what they want to do, can they reject the rules and the, and the, the rightful laws of, a, of the federal government, in essence, who is sovereign and supreme? I mean, that's, that's an, uh, fundamentally one of the issues, too, of the war, is who is sovereign and supreme. It's wrapped up in the slavery issue, which is the, the central issue, of course, uh, but it's also there, too. So so uh, the, the sovereignty issue uh, there. So Jackson is going to get crossways with uh, lots of characters. You're going to have a great debate between Robert Hayne uh, and uh, Daniel Webster. Daniel Webster delivers this masterful uh, repudiation of the nullification doctrine, which, by the way, started with Jefferson and Madison, but was updated by Calhoun, uh, and basically uh, just pulls the pants down of Hayne in a debate. I say debate. It was more of a re uh, remarks rebuttal situation in the U.S. Senate. And then, uh, very famously, uh, also during this nullification crisis, and it's not a, a quick thing, it takes years to come to a head, uh, at a Jackson, rather a Jefferson Day dinner in the, the, the Democratic Party, everybody of prominent uh, stature in the party and politics was there in this one giant uh, room in Washington, D.C. You had the president, the vice president, senators, congressmen, their friends, family, hangers-on, and other onlookers. It's... Uh, it's it's a it's a event. There's lots of food in the era we've talked about. There's lots of whiskey. Uh, people get deeper into cups and they start making toast. That's what they always did in these Jefferson Day events: and toast to this, and toast to the flag, toast to the president, toast to Jefferson, toast to this, toast to the coat hanger. You know, whatever the case may be. And so uh, when Jackson stood up and he. Uh, he, people have said by this point in time, you could see he was immaculately dressed, but he was really starting to show the wear and tear of life. Jackson stands up and he holds up his glass and he says, our federal union, it must be preserved. And as Jackson said this, he is staring a hole through the vice president, who had talked about, as it were, through nullification, the implication was splitting, breaking apart, ripping asunder. The Federal Union. Jackson once more. Our Federal Union, it must be preserved. And then if you can imagine all, I mean, Jackson by doing that throws the gauntlet down. Uh, the fact that he stared a hole through the Vice President when he did it, and Jackson's no man to trifle with. As someone asked later of a U.S. Senator named Thomas Hart Benton, who was also Jackson's friend by this point in time too, said, Jackson, if, if Jackson talks about ropes, you you better look for hangings, because he's not the sort who idly threatens. This isn't a threat per se, but it's pretty close. Then Calhoun takes it, and some said his hand was trembling because he was nervous. Others said he was scared. The debates, uh, that's a, uh, probably a small I uh, issue. He holds up this uh, uh, his own goblet and says, Our federal union, uh, excuse me, our, uh, the federal union next to our liberties most dear. And he goes on and adds a few more words. And at that point, you can imagine in the room, people's heads snap back to the president. Well, Jackson was a lot of things, and Smart was one of them. He may not be well uh, read in a classic sense. He may have had trouble spelling uh, words. But Jackson was also smart enough to know that his words were like a rifle shot. Boom. Our federal union must be preserved. Everybody knew what he meant. Jackson said nothing more. And that was the end of it. It was no good for Jackson to get into a verbal debate with uh, Calhoun was far superior. But there was that split in the room. Eventually, South Carolina, because of the tariff of abominations and because of all the uh, heartaches and issues and so forth over it, the South Carolina eventually is going to uh, pass uh, what are some, you might call some nullification articles in the South Carolina legislature. Jackson, through the Congress, got what was raised up, what was called a force bill, basically which was 
if South Carolina tries to break away, if South Carolina tries to nullify and ref and prevent the actual collection of a federal tariff, the, and by force especially that means blood is shed, then Jackson could call up the army, call up the militias, call in the and and basically crush South Carolina and bring them to hill. Jackson himself said very directly, he said, if in, if any uh, federal agent, meaning any federal clerk's blood is shed in the collection of this tariff, I will hang the first nullifier I can get my hands on. Uh, when, as I said a minute ago, when Jackson made a threat, he didn't idly threaten. He meant it. So when it all comes to uh, Jackson and this uh, threat, at the same time this is going on, Jackson, who hated Henry Clay, and Clay despised Jackson, when it was all said and done, Jackson's, uh, rather Henry Clay, is going to offer the South Carolinians an exit ramp. Basically, it's the idea, we'll lower the tariff sum to give you a fig leaf to get off of this collision course with Jackson because you're not going to win. No southern state in 1833 rallies to, uh, to South Carolina's side. Jackson, it must be remembered, is a Tennessean, which is considered a southerner. He owned slaves as well. He was no, uh, he was no New England abolitionist. But all that to say is, is that eventually, on the same day that the force bill was uh, passed by the Congress, so was the uh, reduction of the tariff. South Carolina shrieked and whimpered, but they backed down. Jackson held firm, and the crisis was averted. This probably was one of the most maximum, between the founding of the nation and the Civil War itself, this was the maximum moment of crisis where the country could have uh, render, uh, been ripped apart, ripped asunder under the hands of a less stable leader. Uh, Jackson was, uh, he, he was a lot of things, but when he was in, uh, author had authority, uh, he believed in law and order. Secondly, the last major issue that was worth noting about Jackson's presidency is what's known as the Bank War. In the Bank War, Jackson uh, is going to get crossways with the Second Bank of the United States. Now, the Second Bank of the United States was a creature of 1816. It was established in 1816, and it had a 20-year charter, according to the Congress. The president of the Second Bank of the United States in 1832 is a fellow named Nicholas Biddle, B-I-D-D-L-E. -E. Now, Nicholas Biddle was a sharp man, but he was a bad po political man. He was not good. He had a 10-year politically, meaning he wasn't good at it. He was sharp uh, on the money. He knew how to buy senators. Uh, Daniel Webster was one of his, uh, was on his retainer. That's probably not good that a, a, the major bank in the United States that it controls federal money, amongst other things. It was a depository of the U.S. government. Also is also purchasing and putting on its board of directors the, uh, um, uh, senators who are voting on its existence and where the money goes and so forth. Uh, that's not a good, that's a conflict of interest in all honesty. Which is all to say that, uh, Jackson, excuse me, that, uh, Biddle is a powerful man. It's true today, even today, that the Federal Reserve Chairman, which is not the Second Bank of the United States, two separate institutions, the Second Bank's long dead. The Federal Reserve Chairman is a powerful man, and if the Federal Reserve wants to do something, they can. All right, so Jackson uh, is troubled by banks. Part of the reason Jackson is troubled by banks is what had happened to him and thousands of other Americans, especially Westerners, in the Panic of 1819. The Panic of 1819 blew up the the banking system of the United States and the Western United States for the better part of six years. Jackson came within an eyelash of losing everything he owned, including the, essentially the land, the house, uh, the clothes on his back, because of land speculation, bad banks, uh, banking practices, and whatnot. But what Jackson and others come to figure, uh, come to find out, and come to believe is is that the banks were against working men were against small timers, were against landowners, and so forth. And frankly, in some respects, they did not understand the working of a somewhat modern bank. But Jackson understood this, too, is, is that, that Nicholas Biddle was playing politics. And Biddle, in 1832, is going to uh, make a deal with uh, soon-to-be uh, Senator Henry Clay. Henry Clay had gone out for a while, but had come back into public life. He was from Kentucky, as we both all know. And Biddle uses the bank to back Henry Clay in the election of 1832. 
And that is really not right. Uh, it is not right. It's profoundly dangerous on a political, governmental scale. Uh, corruption, uh, it, undue influence, et cetera, and so forth. Uh, that, that was a major issue. And it played into Jackson's narrative and played into Jackson's mind that the bank was a malignant force in society and it was attacking him, who Jackson himself looked upon himself as a tribune and a protector of the people. And Jackson one time uh, called it a hydra-headed monster. Another time Jackson will say it like this. Jackson was literally on his deathbed, it seemed like, and he kind of rallies up off of it. Van Buren, who saw him in the White House, said Jackson was as white as a specter. He said, the bank is trying to kill me, but I will kill it. And when Jackson declared war on somebody or something, he normally got the scalp he was looking for. The Whigs and the acolytes uh, and friends of the bank are going to pass a bank recharter bill in 1832 to kind of drop this into Jackson's lap and to force Jackson to make a choice, which they thought both were bad for Jackson. If he signs the bank bill, it pisses off Westerners who are in favor, it pisses off Westerners who are against the bank. If he vetoes the bank bill, it makes mad Jackson's friends in the middle Atlantic states, Maryland, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, who are in favor of the bank. So they thought they, Biddle and Clay and others, thought they had, and the Whigs, thought they had Jackson and damned if he did, damned if he didn't, sort of uh, advice. But Jackson was a better politician than they gave him credit for. And in Jackson's case, and in 1832, what he does is he issues a, uh, a bank uh, denunciation, a bank veto that says basically, this isn't right and I'm going to, I'm going to defend the people, and it's really a manifesto for the election of 32. Jackson wins comfortably over his arch enemy Clay, and the next issue is, ne is this, when does the, what happens to the bank? Jackson, because he'd been attacked by the bank, is not going to recharter the bank. It's that simple. And Biddle is uh, going to try to beat Jackson, and m many of the men, in fact all the men who go up against Jackson, ultimately find themselves uh, in trouble. All, that, all this is to say, to make it quick and brief to the point, uh, Jackson is going to win this, what's called the bank war. Jackson will start to have uh, removed out of the bank deposits, the federal bank, uh, deposits of money out of the bank itself, and basically defund the bank, uh, Second Bank of the United States. Biddle is broken. He's physically broken. He's mentally broken, spiritually broken. He doesn't live all that long, uh, and he's one of many who have gone up against Jackson and lost. Now, to be fair, and I think it was the right choice by Jackson to go after the bank like that, the fact was, however, it did cause what is known as the Panic of 1837, because all those deposits that were in Biddle's bank now went to state banks, many of which were pets of uh, and friends uh, indirectly of Jackson's. But these state banks, whom Jackson did not control, uh, they started loaning all that money out willy-nilly and inflates the money supply. Free money, it seemed like, and there's a lot of bad loans and, and wads of cash that are made. Uh, by 1837, the economy tanks, the banking system teeters on the edge of collapse, but Jackson's not president, and the man who replaces him is in trouble for it, and he pays the price. That man is Martin Van Buren. In 1836, Jackson comes to an end as president of the United States. Uh, his uh, Jackson's presidency is quite rem remarkable. It's certainly very important. Uh, he tried to bring Texas into the fold, but that would not work. However, when you talk about 1836, Jackson is going to, to anoint his heir apparent, which is Martin Van Buren. Van Buren runs against a fractured Whig ticket, which was a, a mistaken gambit on the Whig political party's uh, part. And the fact of the matter is, is that Jackson, Jackson's heir apparent, Van Buren, wins. Van Buren's presidency is not memorable. In fact, it's pretty bad. And because of the issues going on in Texas, but more especially with the economic souring that goes on because of the Panic of 37, Van Buren's presidency is wrecked and irre irrecably or ir irreconcilably, that's not it, irre ir irrecably, I guess. That's not the right word. I'm not looking for it. But it is hurt. It is uh, damaged beyond repair. Uh, it cannot be reconciled and fixed. So, in 1840, as you notice, the pace is picking up. Jackson is in retirement in uh, in the Hermitage in Tennessee. He's uh, still an influential character. In 1840, the, the Whigs settle on their version of Andrew Jackson, and that man's name is William Henry Harrison. Now, you know William Henry Harrison from the stuff over at Horseshoe, excuse me, at uh, Tippecanoe in Indiana. 
William Henry Harrison was a war hero. And this is the Whig uh, philosophy in 1840. We can't beat Jackson or Jackson's people with a professor. We can't beat him with a dandy. We need to beat Jackson and his type with a, our own Andrew Jackson. And so the Whigs are going to portray William Henry Harrison as this backwood bumpkin, rough-hewn uh, fighter, so forth, kind of a common man. They said he was born in a log cabin. It's called the Log Cabin and Hard Cider Campaign. And William Henry Harrison is going to pick a nominal Whig, really, who's a Democrat, actually, got out of Virginia, a guy named John Tyler. And William Henry Harrison runs in 1840 and wins. He wins uh, quite easily because of the unpopularity of Van Buren and the, uh, the, the blame of the panic upon Van Buren and the Democrats. In fact, actually, had the Whigs run their favorite son of Henry Clay, he becomes president in all likelihood. But they don't, and he doesn't. And so we talk about Clay, and we talk about now William Henry Harrison. Harrison was not born in a log cabin. It was about a ten-room log cabin. It was really more of a mansion. William Henry Harrison is no fool. He is no ignoramus. He is no unlettered man. He spoke, uh, he rather read Latin, and I believe he also could do a little bit of Greek in addition to other languages and such. He was quite smart. And in 1833, excuse me, 1841, when Harrison is to be inaugurated, Harrison, who is approaching 70 years old, I believe he was 68 at the time, decides he is going to give a learned and thoughtful and long speech, uh, inaugural address, and he does it in a cold, about 35, 40 degree rain without a slicker on or a hat. Well, you know as well as I do, standing out in the cold rain, being an old man and so forth, is a recipe for, well... You guessed it, pneumonia. And he dies of pneumonia in, in a few days. Uh, in fact, actually 30 days, a month later, he dies of pneumonia. And what do you do next? So for the first time in American history, the president of the United States is dead. And what happens next? Well, John Tyler is the next man up. We'll talk about the Tyler administration, Texas annexation, and moving beyond in the next lecture. Thank you.